This week on Wealth Track, two market pros debate investment outlook and strategy. In a television exclusive, the Tocqueville Fund's contrarian manager, Robert Kleinschmidt, takes on Morgan Stanley Smith Barney's chief investment officer, Jeff Applegate, over bull versus bear, stocks versus bonds, and emerging versus developed markets. Next on Consuelo Mac, Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Research affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market. Wintergreen, your home for global value. Rosalind P. Walter and the Dreamin Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuela Mack. Bull markets climb a wall of worry is an old Wall Street adage. The question is what happens when that proverbial wall of worry turns into Mount Everest? Or in the case of recent events, a tsunami, a catastrophic earthquake, nuclear crisis or a region-wide uprising in the Middle East, an area containing 60% of the world's known oil reserves. Considering everything going on in the world, I am astounded at how well the markets have absorbed these shocks. Depending upon whom you talk to, the market is either reasonably priced or relatively expensive. According to Standard & Poor's Investment Policy Committee, the index is selling at a reasonable 13 to 14 times this year's estimated earnings. However, if you use a metric created by Yale economist Robert Schiller, which looks at longer-term patterns, his CAPE index takes into account 10-year periods of inflation-adjusted annual earnings since 1881, the S&P is selling at a price-earnings ratio of more than 23. As Bob Schiller put it, that's far above the average of around 15. Now, don't get me wrong, investors have been reacting to recent events. In what the Wall Street Journal has termed a risk-on, risk-off mode, investors have been swinging between fear trades, such as treasuries and other defensive plays, to optimism plays, such as stocks and commodities. The S&P 500 is a case in point. After an impressive start to the new year, the index reversed course in late February, just before the outbreak of violence in Libya, losing nearly 7% before starting its recent recovery. And it's not just stocks that are being buffeted, so are bonds. Even with yields on the 10-year Treasury note near historic lows, the swings in the yields have been wide, ranging from just above 2% in early 2009 to nearly 4% in March of last year. According to the investment team at New York Life, we haven't seen this dramatic a two-year stretch in Treasury yield moves since the mid-1990s over 15 years ago. So how should you invest in these tumultuous times? Who better to ask than two investment pros who are global in scope with differing views and investment styles? Jeff Applegate is the Chief Investment Officer of Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, responsible for strategic and tactical asset allocation advice to clients. He leads the firm's investment strategy team and chairs its global investment committee. Robert Kleinschmidt is CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Tocqueville Asset Management, where he oversees $11 billion in assets, including the Tocqueville Fund, which he has managed for nearly 20 years, beating the market and competitors with his contrarian value style. I started by asking them to assess the impact recent events have had on their investment outlook. Let's take Japan first. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it was an immense human natural disaster. and. But if you look at other disasters of that magnitude over time, whether it was Kobe in Japan or Katrina here in the U.S. or Chernobyl in the former Soviet Union, at the end of the day, did they disrail the global business cycle recovery or whatever was going on in financial markets? The answer is no. So very destabilizing event on a short-term basis, uh, but we don't think it's going to derail sort of everything else that's going on around the planet, which is pretty good news. And Robert, I think you agree because when I called you a couple of days ago, you know, you said, well, this too shall pass. <laughs> this too shall pass, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what's, what's your perspective on the events, and on, on the investment outlook? Well, more from our point of view, since we're very micro-oriented, bottom-up-oriented, 
we think about these big things, but we don't really try to incorporate them too much in our investment strategy. What we do try to do is take advantage of downdrafts in the market that occur when these events occur. So, for example, we bought a few more Japanese stocks as a result of we bought Hitachi and we bought uh, a uranium producer because we thought that the, uh, we, we strongly feel that nuclear energy is going to be a part of the future whether we like it or not and that there may be a six month period where people don't really want to talk about it too much or don't want to, or politicians want to uh, demagogue the issue but at the end of the day nuclear is too important a part of the overall picture for it to go away so we think uranium is going to be here. We bought an insurance company in Japan, actually an American insurance company that sells uh, cancer insurance in Japan. Aflac. Yeah, mm. Aflac, right. Mm. And that Big stock, yes. Their business <clears throat> that's right. In Japan. So, I mean, that, that, what we try to do when these situations occur is assume that they won't be forever and look at the opportunities that uh, uh, come about as a result of it. So. So, so, they're incremental steps that you take. They're not game changers. They're not game changers and they're not big strategic overlays because we're not smart enough to do big strategic overlays. We're pretty smart at picking good stocks, but not the, the top-down view is too, is, you know, there are too many variables, I think. Well, that is what Jeff does, actually, is the, is the top-down view. So, Jeff, what is your big-picture investment outlook? The big-picture investment outlook is that we're still in a positive cycle for financial assets, for risk assets, so the equity market rally which got underway in the U.S. And, and most places back in March uh, 2009. We're now two years into it and still counting. Uh, so our core call is that we still think we're on in terms of a multi-cycle, multi-year bull market. Let me ask you about that because our viewers should know you were very early and it was a very gutsy call mm -hmm. in early 2009 when you went bullish. Well, sometimes you get it right. And and <laughs> no, and, and and you know, correct then, at, you know, the, the market has more than doubled since then. I mean, commodities mm -hmm. have soared. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the risk assets you call them high yield bonds, for instance, have you know have done tremendously well. Right. What's going to drive those risk assets from here and 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 you know, why do you think that the cyclical bull market that you just described is, is going to continue. Right. Well, the key thing for the stock market is the profit growth outlook. Robert obviously focuses in on individual securities where he thinks earnings can you know, do better than expectations and you'll outperform. We focus overall in terms of asset classes. And if earnings are growing pretty robustly, which they are, we think earnings growth in the U.S. and at the global level will be 13 to 15 percent this year. And that should be a pretty good mix for both U.S. and global equities. And if you look at earnings growth in some other areas of the planet, like emerging markets, uh, earnings growth is actually a little bit in excess of that. So by extension, uh, that asset class as a subset of equities potentially can do even better. So what about the argument, and, and Robert, I, mean, I don't know if you want to make that. Number one, uh, the, the argument is that we've seen a lot of cost-cutting inventory build, at least in the U.S., and that's why, in fact, we've had this really pretty phenomenal, robust snapback in, I think in corporate that, profitability, I think, but what's going to drive it from here? I mean, what's... Well, and more to the point, it, not just what's going to drive the earnings, although I think you can make a case that earnings will continue to grow because we are in a nascent recovery of sorts, but more to the point, uh, how are those earnings going to be valued? And the, the argument that I'd make if, if I were looking at things from a top-down point of view and what makes us cautious in general is that I don't see any particular reason for price earnings ratios to expand from here. So if the markets are going to continue to do better, they're going to have to do better on the basis of better earnings, but they're not mm -hmm. going to do better on the basis of better earnings plus better valuations, because I think valuations are going to be swimming upstream, in part because I think the extraordinarily low interest rates that prevail around the world, and particularly in the United States, are going to begin to creep up, as they have, have recently. And that will have a negative impact, deleterious impact, on, on price earnings ratios. So. We can, the, the market can clearly continue to do well on the basis of stronger earnings, but it, you're not going to get that slingshot kind of effect that you get when you have both better earnings and higher valuations. That I don't see. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. I mean, we're not counting on, for instance, the price earnings multiple for the market to expand from, from where we are. We don't see any reason for that to occur. But if earnings are good, um, and we think they can be, and it's not just really just cost cutting. I mean, if you look at the latest earnings reports, revenues were up 9% mm -hmm. in the last quarter for the S&P 500. So actually sales are kicking in, top line is kicking in. So if you have a combination of good labor productivity, uh, you've got profit margin expansion, which can't go on forever, but it can go on for a period. So you can actually have earnings grow faster than sales. We're at that point, we think, in the cycle, which again, can't persist forever, but it can persist for a while. So and for the market a while will discount being that. 
a while, I think, into 2012. I, I think, you know, the big event for the market, um, and I think to your point, Robert, is because the Fed can't stay on hold forever. Right. And at some point, interest rates are going to have to come up from zero. That's probably not this year, but that's next year. And at some point, too, we'll begin to see some inflation pressures build. And you can see signs of that. You're seeing that already. Not, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You can begin to see signs of that already. Yeah. So that will become more of an issue for the market, but that's well into 2012. What are the biggest risks now to the market, to the world economy? Robert, what do you think? Well, and I, and I mean, you're a contrarian who loves yeah. to look at risks. Well, I, I think that the, the by far the biggest risk is, is if the general public begins to incorporate higher inflationary expectations into their thinking. And if that is the case, then we'll begin to see uh, sharply higher inflation rates. And from a government's point of view, particularly our government's point of view, higher interest rates are a killer. Because we have $14.2 trillion worth of government debt, and that's before the agency debt, and, the, and that's before the unfunded liabilities. And our current interest bill at, at the government level is about $225 billion. That's a percent a and a half, yes. Right. That's a percent and a half. That's pretty cheap debt. If that debt goes from a percent and a half to 5%, and all of us here are old enough to remember when government debt was 5% and higher, then all of a sudden that $225 billion is $700, $800, $900 billion, even if the budget deficit doesn't continue to increase, which we know it will. And as a percent of GDP, that's <clears throat> a huge So mm -hmm. if, if instead chunk. of having $14 trillion uh, of outstanding government debt, we have $20 trillion, and if we have 5% interest rates or 6% interest rates as opposed to 1.5%, all of a sudden we got a trillion dollars plus in interest expense at the federal government level, leave alone what happens at the state level. That's a huge risk. So the one thing you have to pay attention to, and I think the one thing Bernanke has to pay attention to, is keeping the inflation genie inside the bottle because it has powerful negative impact on, on government deficits, government spending, public finance, and eventually mm -hmm. the market as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, as far as your concern, I, I, number one, you ag agree with that analysis, right? That that's a yeah, big on, on problem a long -term out basis. there? I mean, on a more short-term basis, right. I'd, I'd say when you say, you know, where's the risk? To me, the risk is always in a policy mistake. And a near-term risk could be um, the head of the European Central Bank two weeks ago said, you know, well, it looked like we were maybe going to raise interest mm -hmm. rates, Trichet, we're going to raise interest rates in autumn, but now it looks like we'll do it maybe April, May. Um, the European economy is already not robust. Um, you don't have strong job growth. You've got all this fiscal policy tightening on the path to fiscal union in the euro area. And on top of that, you want to tighten? That's a policy mistake. So we're very alert. I think the Fed, by contrast, has remained committed to QE, and they're not going to begin to exit until after June as planned, which right, is appropriate. Right, the quantitative easing, too, where they're buying these treasuries, right. $600 exactly. billion exactly. Dollars worth, right. And, you know, we're just beginning to see signs now that maybe job growth is picking up to the above 200,000 jobs a month level, which is what the Fed needs to see sustainably before they should start exiting. So I think the Fed, at the moment, they're a great example of a central bank that's getting it right. European Central Bank is maybe at the moment an example of, of a central bank that's about on the margin to get it wrong. So, so policy is always a risk. The other thing that you do have that, that we d haven't talked about but that's very important in my view is that corporate balance sheets are in really terrific shape. Incredibly and they don't have, there isn't a lot of capital spending that anyone wants to do because they don't really see a lot of growth, which means that corporations, and particularly on a stock specific basis, which is what we're interested in, there's a lot of corporations that can do a lot of shareholder friendly things with their excess capital. And, and, and that for can instance, be, we're just seeing some of that right, that's right. now. I and mean, that can be beneficial. Cisco, for instance, right. mm -hmm. first ever dividend yeah, payout. Dividends. The banks are now starting to pay dividends. Share buybacks. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And mm -hmm. so, in, in a relatively slow growth economy, which is what I think we have, without a lot of investment opportunities, which is what I think is the case in the United States, there's an opportunity for a, a huge swath of corporate America to return capital to their shareholders in a beneficial way. So that's, I think, bullish as well, or at least a potential bullish. Uh, and, and, and Jeff, is, is that, that's part of your kind of what you see as a very constructive outlook as well, right? Is, is that these shareholder friendly actions that, that companies can, can take no using question. their cash because, I mean, because the earnings growth has been as robust as it's been, and you have all these opportunities to distribute it to, to shareholders. Yeah. Before we leave the risk part of this, and, and Robert, I, I know that one of the things that you have said and you've told shareholders in the Tocqueville Fund is avoiding losers by managing price risk is a key focus of yours. Instead of focusing on the winners per se, you're focusing on not losing money is, is really important. Why is that? Why is well, just empirically, whenever I look at my results right. and I see that I have a good period, good 
quarter, a good year, a good six months or Last so. Last year, it's because right. it's be, it's more due to the fact that there are few losers and no significant ones than there are due to any particularly outstanding upside uh, stock. So I mean, just on an empirical basis, it seems to me that the the way to preserve capital and to grow it is is to avoid picking stocks that have a lot of up, uh, downside risk to them. And the way we try to do that, and you're never completely successful, but the way we try to do that is we're very, so we like to buy stocks when they're already down, when the enthusiasm has been run out of them, and there isn't a lot of positive news that's clearly visible to people. And at that point, the stock price is cheap. There, it's not clear what will make it go up, but if we can construct a scenario that's convincing to us over a three to five year period that the consensus could change, things could get better, I'd much rather own a stock like that than own something where there's a lot of expectations that can be disappointed. I mean, give you a great example is Microsoft, which is a stock we've owned for a long time. I mean, the stock, it's, it's not well loved. <laughs> it's, I can't, it's very hard to find people who really like this stock. Yet the financials are fabulous. Uh, the market share is very high. Their, their revenues are growing. Uh, the valuations are cheap. I, I don't mind sitting with a stock like that because I don't think that I can really get hurt by it. I don't know what's gonna take it up, but I'm reasonably certain that all the negatives for a stock like that are out there, and I've got all these good financial metrics to keep me company while I'm waiting for something good to happen. So, so Jeff, l let's talk about your strategy as well, because you're in mm -hmm. charge of asset allocation for clients at Morgan Stanley Smith Barney. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so w where are you allocating clients' assets? We're allocating to equities as mm -hmm. sort of the preeminent risk asset right. class. And within equities, we have a pretty significant overweight to emerging market equities, which we think have the strongest growth prospects. Developed markets broadly defined, we're, we're, we're underweight. But equities as an asset class, we like as compared to bonds, where we're underweight. Mm -hmm. And in the bond market, the area that we would most avoid is really treasuries, the treasury market, where as the economic cycle continues to grow, as the market over time begins to discount the fact that the Federal Reserve Board at some point takes up interest rates, you'll see a further sell-off in the long end of the bond market. So it's going to be tough to avoid losses in, in the Treasury market, we think. And so the opportunities in bonds are going to be more in the more economically sensitive sector of the bond market. Which are? Investment grade credit mm -hmm. and high yield. So, so the, the, the winners of the last two years, basically, uh, you're yeah. still going to continue to yeah. ride that? Not to the degree that you're going to see those kind of returns. You won't. Right. I mean, those were spectacular returns, sort of once in a generation kind of returns. But if we're in a long cycle environment, a low inflation environment, which we think we are, that's generally a pretty good environment for credit investment grade as well as high yield to do pretty well and we think uh, as compared to treasuries uh, a much better place to be. So, so Robert how are you positioning your portfolios for the uh, for eventuality of well, inflation? We, you know, we're, we're sort of gold. well known for being in the gold market which I don't you know I don't really view that so much as an investment as I do in alternative cur currency. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, what is a currency it's supposed to do? It's a currency substitute? Yes, it's a currency substitute. What makes money money is that it's a medium of exchange, it's a unit of account, and it's a store of value. That's what makes money money. And you can't say that paper money does that very well right this minute. And the sort of the store of value function has been taken over, in my view, by, by gold, and I think it's a good place to be in that mm -hmm. as an insurance policy, you want to hold 5 to 10% of your portfolio in, in gold or gold-denominated assets of one kind or another. I like Timberlands. That's been an unfavorable asset for a period of time. It's a, an inflation hedge. But how do we buy Timberlands? Well, you can buy through, you, know, you can wire, wire house or you can buy, which is converted to an REIT. Rainier is an REIT is another example. But or you can own them privately. But the point is that that uh, th this uh, asset class has been out of favor because it's tied to housing. But it's still over time, it's been a good inflation hedge. So it's a way of getting into an inflation hedge, which is fairly cheap at the moment compared to most inflation hedges, which mm -hmm. are not. Uh, Jeff, gold, quickly before I mm -hmm. ask you something mm -hmm. else. Sure. Uh, <laughs> we don't directly allocate to gold. Mm -hmm. We allocate to commodities, of which you know, right. gold is a subset of uh, precious, uh, but, but, precious metals. But why not? Why don't you specifically allocate to Because gold? I have um, actually almost the same view. Gold, to me, is not an investment store value. And you want to own it during two, really, periods. One is a period of high inflation. So obviously, it was good to have in the 70s. But um, to your point, starting in the 80s and the 90s, you didn't want to own gold for mm -hmm. a couple of decades, years. actually, yeah. quite, quite a while. 
Um, so Until it works in high inflation. The last three years, it's worked out really And it well. also works when there's concern about the value of fiat currency, paper currencies created right. by governments. We're overweight commodities, broadly defined, but that's a play really on the global economic recovery and our view that the stronger growth is going to be in the emerging markets versus the developed markets, and they're much more resource intensive than the developed markets as they grow. So we think we've got a multi-year bull cycle for commodities, much as we had in the last business cycle. Um, and we think that just got underway in the last six, nine months. So if you were to put on a contrarian hat, take Robert's position, mm -hmm. it, it, is, the, is there a, a sector of the market right now that, that, is, that is not necessarily done well that, that you think is being overlooked or undervalued or, you know, is, is there a place that, again, that hasn't... That yeah, I mean, cer certainly one sector. Happened. I mean, if you look at what's done well, it's really been the industrial side of the economy. It's been industrial cyclicals and it's been energy and it's been those kinds of uh, companies. What has really lagged have been some of the more consumer names, some of the more consumer cyclical names. And the valuation there looks to be, you know, reasonably compelling. Mm -hmm. And we're moving now in a business cycle where... Uh, we think we are entering the self-sustaining mode of the business cycle over the next few months. If that's right, then that should bode pretty well for the consumer cyclical sector. Let's talk about the one investment, this thing that all of us should own some of in a long-term diversified portfolio. Robert, what's your one investment recommendation well, for it's, us? Well, you know, everyone is talking about the pigs, and I want to talk about <laughs> hogs. Uh, so the pigs are Portugal and uh, you know, Ireland, Spain, Spain, Ireland, Spain, Ireland, Italy. Greece. Right. Um, but Hogs is a, is a company <laughs> that is located in China. Uh, it's traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Its uh, name is Zhongpin, and it's a pork producer, hence the name Hogs. And, and, and they, they love pork in China. They love, they're the, they're the largest consumers of pork in the world on a per capita basis, and why not? It's great. What makes this company interesting is that it's growing very rapidly. It's, uh, it's a, a, one of the top five producers and processors of pork in the country. It's favored by the government, which is important in places like, like China in that their government subsidizes them to, for certain plants that they're building, et cetera. The problem with the company and the reason, and I recommended this company a couple years ago when I was on the show and it went from 12 to 24 and it's dropped back down to around 15 again. I started buying it again. The problem with this company is because it's growing so fast, they're continue, they continue to do equity financing. And that the market doesn't like that, and they're not very skilled at displaying their uh, or telegraphing their equity, equity financing. So from time to time, you get a hiccup, and the market gets disgusted with it, and the stock collapses, and as it did recently, went from the low twenties down to fourteen, fifteen dollars a share. But it's still growing at fifty percent. Earnings are growing at fifty percent. Earnings per share are growing at fifteen percent. Stock trades at about nine times earnings, and it's a great way to play the development of the consumer market in in China. So. Unlike the stocks that I normally like, which where the balance sheets are great and the, the management's are shareholder friendly, this is sort of the opposite, but the growth potential is so good here and the valuation is, is cheap enough. And I don't think that this is an area of the Chinese economy which goes south even if the Chinese tighten the screws a little bit to keep their economy under control. So as long as there's not an outbreak of swine flu in China. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> as long as there isn't. <laughs> so hogs. But if it, does, if it does happen, you can be sure we'll be buying some more stock. Jeff Ablegate, what, what is, what's the one investment that you would recommend we own some uh, of? Emerging market equities. And, and I understand that's not the freshest idea. Uh, but no, we... but act, actually, in, in all fairness, right now, I think that is kind of a contrarian call because a lot okay. of the markets have not done well, and a lot of people right. are saying avoid emerging markets. They're too dangerous regardless. So. Well, well they, yeah, on a, on a, on a short-term basis, since last November, they've, they've been underperforming mm -hmm. um, for some of the reasons we already talked about. Central banks are tightening, and that's creating correction, all that stuff. If, if you look on a very long-term basis and go back to when emerging markets only represented about 2% of global equity market cap, today it's 14 15%, so an enormous increase. And for uh, an American who's was U.S. dollar-based, we all know we had two back-to-back -back bear markets before the low in March 2009, so you lost money for 10 years in U.S. equities. If you had owned emerging market equities over that period, your annual average return in dollars would have been almost 10% because that's where the best growth is on the planet. I mean, if you look at a lot of these economies, they've got emerging markets and middle classes, which are tiny compared to where we are in Europe, in the US, other developed countries. So they're very early stage in their growth path, and we've done a lot of work on emerging market equities. If they grow the way they've grown uh, over the next 10 years, as they have trailing 10 years, then as a share of global equity market cap, they won't be 15% anymore. They're gonna be closer to 25.
That's a big change. All right, so we have the big picture, Jeff Applegate talking about emerging markets, and we have the, the bottom up, uh, Robert Kleinschmidt talking about hogs. <laughs> so thank you both very much. Jeff Applegate from Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, Robert Kleinschmidt from the Tocqueville Funds, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having us. It was fun. Pleasure. On that note, we will conclude this edition of Wealth Track. We hope you can join us next week when we will discuss surviving the bond bear market, Bondland's nuclear winter. That is the title of bond manager Marilyn Cohen's thought provoking new book. And if you miss any episode of Wealth Track, just go to our website, wealthtrack.com, where you can see it as a podcast or streaming video. And while you're there, check out our new Wealth Track app so you can tune in on your smartphone or tablet whenever and wherever you are. Thank you for taking the time to visit with us. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Research affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market. Wintergreen, your home for global value. Rosalind P. Walter and the Dreamin Foundation.